Today I want to share with you how to make fruit scrap vinegar using pineapple rinds. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, making fruit scrap vinegar couldn't be easier. And it's a wonderful way to make use of scraps that might otherwise go into the garbage or the compost pile. Today we're going to make fruit scrap vinegar using pineapple rinds. This makes a delightfully yellow colored vinegar with a wonderful pineapple flavor. Plus, this will be a raw vinegar with the mother. And raw vinegar is very rich in probiotics. And probiotics are good bacteria that nourishes our digestive system. And scientists tell us the healthier our digestive systems are, the healthier we are. Well, what I've got here is the rinds from one pineapple. And in addition to your pineapple rinds or other fruit scraps you may be wanting to use to make a vinegar, all you're going to need is a half gallon size jar and a coffee filter or some fabric and a rubber band and a chopstick or some type of knife, something that's long and can be completely submerged into your jar. And then all you're gonna need is some water sufficient enough to fill your jar. Now, preferably, if you have water that is not chlorinated, all the better, because chlorine tends to interfere with the fermentation process, which is what we need to do. We need to ferment these fruit scraps in order to turn them into vinegar. However, I have experimented using both tap water as well as bottled water that's basically a spring water that is naturally chlorine free. And I found that there's not always a significant difference, but our water from the tap is not heavily chlorinated. So you may wanna just get a, a water report, I, I guess that's what it's called, from your local water service and find out what the level of chlorine may be in your water. And if it is highly chlorinated, then you may wanna try using bottled water. Now, can you boil your tap water or leave it out overnight and allow the chlorine to evaporate? Yes, that is an option. However, some of you have shared with me that you live in water districts that use something at, called chloramides or chloramines to sanitize their water. And if that's the case, you've also shared with me that that doesn't necessarily dissipate. So knowing what type of water you have can really help you in the long run as you create your modern pioneer kitchen because the water that you're using can play a significant role in your success when it comes to any type of ferment. And the more we can do to have success, the better. Because as I've shared with you in the past, ferments can often be persnickety. So the more that we can do to help our ferments along, to help them to be successful, the better we are off in the long run. Now, if you've seen my videos on how to make homemade apple cider vinegar and how to make citrus vinegar and how to also make uh, another fruit scrap vinegar from strawberry tops, you may have seen that I do add in a little white sugar to help kickstart the process and feed the good bacteria. And some of you have asked me, can you leave out the sugar? And the answer is yes, if the fruit you're using is exceptionally sweet. So when making apple cider vinegar, if you're using the cores and the peels, say you're doing a fruit scrap version of an apple cider vinegar, and you're using very sweet apples, you may be able to get away with not adding any sugar. So today, I'm gonna to make this fruit scrap vinegar without adding any added sugar because since we are using pineapple and pineapple tends to be very sweet and have a lot of natural sugar, I think that it may work. So when you make fruit scrap vinegar, you can start just using the fruit 
and initially not add any extra sugar. However, within a few days, you will know whether you've been successful or not. Because if you don't start to see some bubbling activity, you will know that the good bacteria may need a little jump start. So at that point, you may want to add a little sugar. Generally, a quarter cup will really help. Now today we're going to use these pineapple rinds and as I mentioned I also have one where I use uh, the tops of the strawberries that makes a lovely uh, beautifully uh, pink hued vinegar with a lovely little strawberry flavor because you have the green stem and then a little bit either of the core or if you just slice it across the top you have a tiny little bit of the fruit on top so that's definitely something fun to make especially as strawberries come in season and I'll be sure to link to that video and then if uh, many of you probably know my sweet friend Heidi over at Rain Country Homestead and Heidi has many vi vi videos on <laughs> many vinegars, many videos on how to make fruit scrap vinegar and I'll definitely link to her channel. Now what you want to do is get a nice sharp knife and then just start to cut this up. The reason that I like to go ahead and cut this up is to just make things a little easier to be mixed in with the water and Hopefully, I don't, I'm not a scientist, I don't know if there's any scientific basis for this, but I feel that when the fruit is cut up a bit more and it's much easier to stir, it seems to be able to turn into vinegar quicker. In essence, you have more surface area, so it would make sense that the process would go a little quicker because maybe more good bacteria can be released into the water. So as you chop this into bite-sized pieces, all you want to do is go ahead and put it into your jar. Now, I just happen to be using a canning jar because that's what I have, but any half gallon size jar will do. And if you don't have a half gallon size jar, but you have two quart size jars, that'll work well too. You're just going to divide up your pineapple rinds, your pineapple rind scraps into the two jars relatively evenly. Now what I've got here is just the rind of the pineapple. Now you may be wondering, what about the core? The core can be pretty tough and it can certainly be used, it certainly can be cut up and used to make this vinegar. However, I like to eat it. I just chop it into small pieces because it's very rich in a compound. And please excuse my pronunciation. You all know I'm the queen of mispronunciation at times. It's either called bromelain or bromelain, something like that. And it's wonderfully rich in anti-inflammatory properties. It also helps with digestion. And so I like to eat that. And then hopefully it'll help with what, whatever little aches and pains I might have, uh, either externally or internally. Uh, we often can have inflammation internally. And uh, it also can help with digestion, as I mentioned. So sometimes it's nice to just uh, enjoy a few pieces, maybe after a heavy meal. So that's usually what I do with the core. Now we're going to fill our jar with some water. I do like to leave a little bit of head space because this is going to bubble and fizz and the pineapple will float and it's good to just give yourself a little bit of leeway so you don't get a lot of overflow. So I'm just going to go ahead and fill this. I've just got enough water here just to get up to about this part of the jar. I'll show you up close. Now all you want to do is take your chopstick or if you've got a long knife or the handle maybe of a wooden spoon would work very well too. And you just want to give this a stir around. Now this is very important. Making vinegar is an aerobic fermentation, meaning a fermentation with air. That's the opposite of an anaerobic fermentation, which means with out air. And an example of an anaerobic fermentation is something like sauerkraut. So if you take cabbage and you want to ferment it to make sauerkraut, everything needs to be weighted down and the oxygen needs to be not present. And so it's an anaerobic fermentation. And when I say weighted down, I mean weighted down under the salty brine that is going to convert the cabbage into sauerkraut. And the same is true of most vegetable ferments. However, when it comes to making vinegar, we now want air 
because the good bacteria that make something like this turn into vinegar is called acetobacter and it's in the air and so we want to get as much acetobacter into our ferment into the making of our vinegar as possible it's very different than an anaerobic fermentation that basically relies on the yeast and good bacteria that exist on the vegetables. And by keeping the oxygen away, we give those yeasts and good bacteria a chance to really proliferate. But here, we want the good bacteria that's in the air to get this process going. So making vinegar is actually very easy. You don't need to worry about weighting this down. You don't need to worry about burping it. You know, if you've seen anaerobic fermentations, you don't need to worry about having any sort of special equipment uh, that helps in an, an anaerobic fermentation. So that's why this is a lot of fun to make, especially if you're new to trying to take something and turn it into something else. So in this case, we're taking fruit scraps and turning it into vinegar. So all you really need to do is get a coffee filter like this, or you can also use a clean scrap of fabric, whatever you have. And then I just like to take a rubber band just to secure this on so that it's not flopping off anywhere. This helps keep it clean, but at the same time to allow the air to, to get into the mixture. Then once a day, or even twice a day, if you remember, you're going to remove this. You're gonna get your chopstick or the handle of a, a wooden spoon, whatever you have, and you're just gonna give this a little spin around. This is going to serve two purposes. One, it's gonna help redistribute everything to make sure that you're getting all of your fruit under the water, and it's going to help bring some of the acetobacter into here by, in essence, oxygenating it. Also, giving it a spin once a day helps any bad bacteria from not developing on the top of it while you're waiting for that good bacteria to kick in and start turning this into vinegar. Now, I just want to mention that if you keep this in a relatively undisturbed place, you can just put your coffee filter on like this and you don't need to worry about the rubber band if you find it a little fussy to work with every day while you're uh, stirring your vinegar, in the your vinegar in the making. Uh, but just make sure you have it in an area where this may not fly off. Now, let's talk about troubleshooting for a minute. If you find that you are developing mold, mold is ten, tends to be different colors, it tends to look fuzzy, and I'm of the school of thought, I'm very uncomfortable about that. And so I usually will discard things and start over. Other people feel that you can just remove the mold and then give it a good stir, and then over time, uh, the whole fermentation process is going to kill any bad bacteria, kill any mold, and make it a very unhospitable environment for mold to proliferate. So that's up to you, but my, I'm of the school of thought, I do prefer to discard it. But I generally don't have a problem with mold when it comes to making vinegar. Something that's more common and something that you might experience is that you'll get what looks like a spider-like uh, web, white, coating on top of your vinegar in the making. And what that is, is that's something called cam yeast. It's just in the air. It can be a little frustrating to deal with. You can just pull that right off and discard it and continue to give your vinegar a good stir. And hopefully it'll get to the point where it's not, uh, it doesn't keep coming back. Uh, but that is a little bit of a challenge if you live in an area where you may have a lot of cam, cam yeast uh, in the air. Uh, it's only happened to me once when I was making one of my batches of a strawberry top vinegar, and I've not had it happen again. But that is something to look for, and you can look up pictures on the internet. It's very prolific. You can find pictures everywhere of it, of what cam yeast looks like. And it's pretty easy to identify, and it's pretty easy to distinguish from what mold looks like. So if you do develop cam yeast, know that it's not a serious problem. It's just sort of, as I said, these things can be persnickety. So just take a spoon, remove it, discard it, continue stirring your vinegar, and hopefully it'll become less of a problem. 
Now the vinegar making process takes about 30 days. And if you watch my series on how to make apple cider vinegar, that will give you an indication of what the process takes. But what you're going to do is stir this, as I said, every day for 30 days and preferably even twice a day. Now, after a few days, you're going to want to start seeing some bubbles. If you don't see bubbles, then you may want to consider adding a little sugar, giving it a good stir, and then see if by the next day or the day after that, you've got some bubbles coming. Now, during this 30-day process, what you're going to find is within maybe a week or so, this is going to smell more like alcohol than vinegar. It's probably going to smell very yeasty, almost like beer. And after about two weeks, you're going to notice that yeasty, almost beer-like smell decreasing and a more acidic aroma increasing. You may have noticed if you ever opened a bottle of wine and then it wasn't finished, and even if you put the cork back in, but you put it in your pantry and forgot about it, over time, it has turned into vinegar. You might find that it has a very vinegary smell and a very vinegary taste because it was exposed to air and the acetobacter is in there and it's turning that wine now into vinegar. Now in 30 days, we're going to come back and check on this and I'll go through the rest of the process with you in terms of straining it and decanting it. But I know that you might have some questions in advance of that. But once this turns into vinegar and we strain it and we decant it, it's basically a forever food. Vinegar is, is really a forget forever food. It doesn't go bad. So you can decant it and store it in, in your pantry. You don't need to store it in your refrigerator. Now after 30 days, you can taste your vinegar and see if you like the flavor, if it tastes acidic enough to you. And if you like the taste, you're all set. But if you're a little nervous as to whether or not it is actually vinegary enough, or you need to let it ferment a little longer, I understand completely. And especially if you're a beginner at this, you may want to use some pH strips to test the pH of your vinegar. Now everybody has different tastes and has different ideas on how acidic they want their vinegar to be. I generally like to let it go for enough time so that the acidity level is between a 3.5 to a 3.0. So if at any point during the fermentation process, you want to check your vinegar to see how acidic it is, you can certainly give it a little taste and then you can use your pH strips to see where it's at in terms of its acidity level. But basically, based on my experience, I've found about 30 days will create the perfect vinegar. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and put my covering on and I'm gonna set this aside and then I'm just gonna give this a stir every day, hopefully twice a day. And in 30 days, I'm gonna come back and show you what we've got. And one more tip I wanna share with you before I put this aside is if you're new to fermentation, as things bubble up, sometimes they can bubble a little over even if you're doing an anaerobic fermentation where you have a lid on. So what I always recommend is whatever type of item or fruit or vegetable or whatever the case may be that you're fermenting, put it in some type of bowl so that wherever you put it, if it does, over, if it does overflow a bit, it's just gonna overflow into a bowl. And trust me, based on experience, I've learned the hard way that if you don't do this, you can wind up with a sticky mess. So let's go ahead and put this aside and we'll come back to this in 30 days. Well, my pineapple vinegar has been in the making for 30 days and now we're ready to strain it. Now, when you're making this at home, you may notice some evaporation. That's to be expected. Now, what I did was stir this every 30 days. I tried to stir it twice a day if I remembered, but I wasn't always perfect about that. So know that if you're not perfect about it either, you're gonna be okay. And after a few days of stirring it, I started to notice that there was lots of bubbling, lots of activity. And I'll overlay a picture so you can see what I saw so that you'll know what to expect when you're doing this at home. 
Then what you'll notice as you go into week two, everything will start to settle down and you won't see any more bubbling and all of the fruit will start sinking down to the bottom. Again, that's totally normal. That's to be expected. Just keep stirring and aerating your vinegar and you're going to be fine. Now, when I was making this pineapple vinegar over the 30 day process, the cam yeast developed that I mentioned earlier. And even though cam yeast is a bit of a pest, I'm glad that it developed in this batch of pineapple scrap vinegar because now I can show you actual pictures of what it looks like. It starts forming on top as somewhat of a white milky colored substance, almost with a little bit of a spiderweb or web-like pattern in it. And I know many of you who have made fruit scrap vinegar in the past have been very concerned about it and was wondering if it was in fact mold, but it's not. It's, as I said, cam yeast. It's a pest, but it's not harmful. What I did was take a spoon, a clean spoon, and I just tried to remove as much of it as possible and then gave my vinegar a really good stir. And during that cam yeast period, I kept removing the cam yeast whenever I would see it appear. And I would try to remember to at least stir my vinegar twice a day and to really stir it. Normally I'll go in uh, under normal circumstances and just give it a stir like no more than this and then take out my chopstick or whatever you're using and put my cap back on and go about my business. But when I see that cam yeast, I remove it and I'll even take like a little uh, tissue and try to remove some of, uh, some of it that forms around the edge. And then I'll get in here and I'll really give it a good stir to try to aerate as possible to help other yeasts and good bacteria take over as opposed to the cam yeast. So know that if that happens to you, as I said, it's just a pest and just do your best to try to keep it under control. And something interesting that I want to share with you is I have never really had cam yeast happen to me a lot. I did have it happen to me on a batch of strawberry scrap vinegar and now on this pineapple scrap vinegar, but I've never had it happen with an apple cider vinegar, uh, whether I'm making it with apples or with apple scraps. And I'm just wondering, I'm just theorizing here. I don't know for sure, but if you have a scientific background and, and you do uh, know more, a little bit more about this than me, what I'm wondering is if when I make these sweeter vinegars, like the strawberry vinegar or this pineapple vinegar, does that in some way attract the cam yeast more than the apple cider vinegars, which are made, which I generally make with much more tart apples. Alrighty, so we've got the cam yeast covered and now that problem is behind us. Next, what I wanna talk about is determining if your fruit scrap vinegar is in essence ready at the 30 day mark to go ahead and strain it. Now I've been making these fruit scrap vinegars for a long time and I'm very used to knowing when they're ready. You know, I'm not afraid to take a taste of it and see if I like it. The aroma, by the way, on pineapple vinegar is wonderful if you like pineapple. And, but in any event, that's usually how I'll determine whether I'm at a point where I'm happy to strain it. But I know that many of you have shared with me that you're very new to this and you want something of a little bit more of a scientific method, so to speak, to know if your vinegar has reached a proper pH and is ready to be strained. And that's where these pH strips come in handy. These things are terrific and I will be sure to put a link to them uh, down in the description below underneath this video. Uh, but keep in mind, you may be able to find these in the pharmacy section at your local grocery store or uh, at an actual pharmacy. Uh, they're pretty common, uh, but I, I like this particular brand and it has, it runs uh, pH from 3.0 to 5.5, which is what I like. There are ones that run more, uh, a, a more broader scale, but I generally just use these for things that I'm fermenting. And when you're doing a uh, traditional ferment, uh, like making a sauerkraut, you always want to make sure that your vegetable ferments are at a pH of 4.6 or lower. 
and that basically tells you that they're ready and that you can go ahead and enjoy them, refrigerate them, whatever the case may be. Now for vinegars, generally I like to go 4.0 or lower. Even 3.0 is nice and that's usually what I'll get with an apple cider vinegar. However, some of my sweeter fruit scrap vinegars like the pineapple and like the strawberry I am suspecting are going to be a little higher than that. I'm not sure you can get them extremely acidic. And the reason that I'm saying that is I just know from experience with my uh, strawberry fruit scrap vinegar, I'm not sure that I was able to get it all the ways down to 3.0 the way that I can with an apple cider vinegar. So now what I'm going to do is just take out a little bit of this uh, Pine, uh, pineapple vinegar. If I can get it out, this may have not been the best spoon to use, but <laughs> I just want to get a little bit and we're going to go ahead and test the pH on this. And I have to thank uh, some of you who shared with me the idea of putting a little bit of the vinegar into a glass rather than dipping the pH strip right in because the pH strip may have some chemicals on it uh, that we wouldn't necessarily want to introduce to our vinegar. So that was a wonderful tip. Alrighty, so now what I'm going to do, I, as I mentioned, I like this brand because you can just sort of pull off and rip a little strip. Uh, some of them come, you know, they're a little larger and uh, you just take out one of the little sticks but some of you have shared with me that you cut them in half and I thought that was a good idea. Alrighty, here we go. Okay, well this looks like it's pretty good and I will take a close-up so that you can see this. But basically we're at, yeah, we're between a 3.5 and a 4.0, so I'm very happy with that. Now the reason we talk about pH and acidity level and we use pH strips as a backup if we're new to fermentation is because you want to make sure that your ferments reach a certain acidity level. And that acidity level is important because when you get below 4.6 and work your way down the pH scale, the, that high acidity level makes a very unhospitable environment for bad bacteria and molds to form. So that's why we always want to make sure whenever we're doing an anaerobic ferment, like making sauerkraut, your vegetable ferments, where you don't want any air and you're creating a lacto ferment using all of the good yeasts and bacteria that are already on the uh, vegetables and fruits that you may be fermenting in that way. Or in this case, an aerobic fermentation with air, where we want the acetobacter to help turn our fruit, basically with water, into some type of vinegar. So that's why acidity level is very important. And these pH strips can be a nice comfort to you, especially if you're new to making any type of ferment where you wanna make sure that you have reached a proper acidity level to prevent uh, anything going bad on you. Now, when I strain this, what I like to do is get a big, I've got a measuring cup, big measuring cup here, but a bowl will work fine. And then I like to get a fine mesh strainer. And then I like to take my mesh strainer and I like to line it with a flour sack towel. Now, if you've seen any of my bone broth videos, you know I love these flour sack towels. Uh, now, you can certainly use cheesecloth if you have it. Uh, also, the commercial sized coffee filters could work well. Uh, I have tried sometimes using the smaller coffee filters, uh, the ones that are like this, you know, that are frilly. Uh, but sometimes they can collapse on me and it just kind of make a little bit of a mess. But I think if you have those commercial grade ones for the big coffee makers, uh, those might work well. But the reason I like these um, flour sack towels is they're reusable. Now in the past, what I would do is just put this right in. I'd start in the corner because I might have to move it along. And someone here gave me a wonderful tip here on YouTube, one of you wonderful viewers who said that you like to wet your flour sack towel first, which helps to discourage it from absorbing whatever you might be straining with it, whether it's a bone broth or a ferment like this. And I just think that's a wonderful idea. So I'm going to do the same thing. Now, I know you may have concerns uh, if your water is heavily chlorinated and you really don't want to introduce any of that. 
into whatever you're straining and I understand that completely. I'm not too concerned about that uh, because our water is not heavily chlorinated and so but I like I do like the idea of being able to retain more of what I'm straining as opposed to having the towel absorb it. So that option is completely up to you and if you want to go ahead as I said and use the commercial coffee filters or um, cheesecloth by all means, and especially if you have a busy household and you really don't want to uh, worry about having to rinse out and then wash all these cloths uh, when you're doing ferments or bone broth or whatever you may be straining, I understand that too. So just pick what's easiest for you to work with. Well, I've rinsed my flour sack towel and then I wrung it out really well. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and push it right down into my strainer. Now, all I'm gonna do is pick up my jar here and go ahead and strain this. Now I poured this out as gently as I could trying to leave the bulk of the pineapple scraps in this jar. Now we will press these to get every little last bit of liquid out of them and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But normally what I do now is I let this drain down into my bowl uh, or a big measuring cup, whatever you're using. And you can basically just walk away from it at this point and do something else if you want. But sometimes if I'm like rushing a little, I'll just start moving my flour sack towel around to kind of speed up the process. Because what you're gonna find is that some of the pineapple has disintegrated into a bit of a puree. So there is some thickness here. You can see it on the uh, flour sack towel. And that does slow the process of the liquid draining down into your bowl. So normally what I do is just start moving things around and speed up the process. I do the same thing with bone broth. And you'll see there's all this puree left behind on the towel. Now what I'll do is just take a spatula like this as pretty much all of the liquid is drained out and I'm left with just a lot of puree and I'll just move it back into the center of my uh, mesh strainer and then I'm going to press it to try to get as much liquid out as I can. So once I get everything best I can scraped off of my towel and back down into my mesh strainer, I'll just take my spatula and I'll just start pressing against this little mush, <laughs> getting out as much liquid as I can until it looks just like kind of fairly dried out, best that you can, you can do it. And then I'll just have this little bit left over. Now, if this meets the requirements of your composter, you could certainly throw this in. Now, once I feel I've pressed out as much liquid from this as possible, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put this aside. I'm gonna actually scoop it out of my mesh strainer. Then I'm gonna go ahead and put all this fruit in here, or fruit scraps. <laughs> and then I'm gonna do the same thing. And I'm just gonna go ahead and push out as much liquid as I can from these pineapple rinds. Now, could you have added this right in when you were originally straining it? Sure, but the only problem is the mesh strainer that I'm working with uh, only has so much capacity and I didn't want things to overflow. So there are variations depending on what you're working with in your kitchen. And I'll just go around with my spatula and I'll just keep pressing on this until I feel that the rinds and the little scraps look fairly dry. Alrighty, well I think this is pretty dry and I've pressed out as much liquid from it that I think I'm gonna get. So now I'll show you how I like to decant this and we can talk about its shelf stability and how long you can expect it to last. Now I do want to share one tip about cleaning your flour sack towels if you decide to use this. I actually used to rinse these out really well and then wash them with my white dish cloths with a little laundry detergent and a little Clorox to keep them white and clean and then I would do a double rinse and I was content with that. That was really what I thought was best to keep it nice and sanitary. But again, like with some of the other tips you all have shared with me, some of you said, 
why not wash your whites like this with vinegar instead of trying to introduce some Clorox into the mix, some bleach. And I thought that was such a good idea. So now I don't use the fruit scrap vinegar. I usually just use a plain white vinegar. So now I'll go ahead and I'll give this a real good rinse in my kitchen sink. And then when I wash my white dish cloths along with all of my flour sack towels, I use a lot of these so they accumulate pretty quickly. And I wash them in vinegar and they wash up beautifully and they have, I don't have to worry about any bleach residue. And they also really stay nice and white. Well, this is just wonderful. I got five cups of pineapple scrap vinegar. And as the name implies, it's just from scraps, from basically the rind of the pineapple that might have gone into the garbage or the compost, whatever the case may be. And instead, we've got five cups of wonderful vinegar. Now, I want to mention, I think many of you know my friend Heidi over at Rain Country Homestead. Heidi really is the vinegar queen. She makes so many types of scrap vinegars from flower cuttings and tree cuttings and herb cuttings. I mean, it's just endless what you can do uh, with things in nature and then turn them into vinegar. So I will be sure to leave a link to her channel in the pinned comment so that you can go check that out. Because I think that if you enjoy, I think once you, you will enjoy this process. And I think once you start doing it, it almost becomes a little addictive that whenever you start to have vegetable scraps or fruit scraps uh, or different things like that, you're like, oh, what can I do with those scraps? And one of those is make vinegar. Now, if you've seen my uh, video on kitchen treasures from the trash, uh, that's basically where these bottles have come from. I know many of you ask me, oh, Mary, where do you buy your bottles? I don't really buy any bottles. I recycle ones that I have. And also, uh, if, if, you're, if you have friends and neighbors and they may just put theirs into their recycling bin, but you think they're bottles that you might be able to use, you can ask them to save them for you. And then I just clean them up and sanitize them. And then I go ahead and use them to decant different things. And I'll be sure to link to that Kitchen Treasures from the Trash video. That's a very popular video. And so many of you shared with me the different things that you find that uh, might be things that would, most people would throw out that you find to recycle in your own kitchen and use. Uh, so that's always a lot of fun. And I love hearing uh, from all of you the different things that you save to use in your traditional foods kitchen. And so uh, be sure to let me know in the comments below the different things things you like to save. But what I'm going to do is this is a 32 ounce jar. Now I've got more than that here. So, but what I'm going to do is put as much as I can in here. Alrighty, let me just start decanting this. Well, this is going nice and smoothly. I really always like to make sure that I have a funnel to help me with these jobs. Now what I'm going to do, let's see. Now this is probably, even though this is a 32 ounce jar, when they package things in here for commercial purposes, I don't think they come up as high as I came. So I was able to get a good amount into this jar. Then I'll just go ahead and put the cap on and now I'm all set. And the rest of this I'm just going to put, go ahead and put in a small jar and I'll just use that quickly over the next few days when I make salads. Now, what to do with this? Vinegar, because it's so acidic, basically is shelf stable. And you can go ahead and put this on your pantry shelf. You can put this in your working pantry or in your extended pantry, and it should stay fresh. Technically, vinegar is considered a forever food. So if you buy raw apple cider vinegar at the grocery store, it's a forever food. If you buy white vinegar, one that's not necessarily raw, it doesn't contain the mother, maybe you buy it for cleaning, uh, that also is in essence a forever food. And you can keep that in your pantry or your extended pantry, and it shouldn't have any type of true expiration date. Now manufacturers will put, you know, best buy dates and things like that on their bottles and on all foods. Uh, but technically vinegar is considered a forever food, meaning that it doesn't go bad. Now, when it comes to homemade things, there's really no way to know 100% if something 
is prepared exactly the way something may have been prepared in the factory. So I can never 100% tell you, yes, this is going to be perfectly shelf stable, or yes, this is going to be a forever food, because it's something that's homemade. So I highly recommend that you experiment. If you are uncomfortable keeping this at room temperature in your pantry, even though it is very acidic and the potential for the growth of bad bacteria or mold has become quite low because the environment is unhospitable, but if you feel uncomfortable about that, by all means refrigerate your vinegar, your homemade vinegars, they'll be fine. The good news is either way, whether you keep this on your pantry shelf or in your refrigerator, it definitely has the mother in it because this is raw. And what that means is it's rich in good probiotics, good bacteria, wonderful for our digestive systems. But of course, always remember that the nose knows. If for any reason you keep this uh, in your pantry, uh, unrefrigerated, or you keep it in your refrigerator and you see anything in it that looks like something other than the little bit of uh, sediment that may develop on the bottom, which is usually the mother. If you notice something that's fuzzy or things like that, that's the development most likely of mold. And then you will want to discard it. At least that's my personal humble opinion. Many people feel that if something is very acidic and you just remove some mold that may form on the top and you give it a good stir and uh, the environment again may not be hospitable to the development of mold, uh, so they decide to keep it. Everybody is different. I'm not comfortable with that. If I see anything develop, develop mold, I will discard it. And a separate issue from that regarding the cam yeast, chances are now that you've strained this and you're putting a cap on it, cam yeast should be less of a problem, but certainly if you see any of that, you can just remove it. But since this is homemade, if it does give you peace of mind, you can refrigerate it. It won't affect the quality at all. Now, just like we talked about vinegar being a forever food, when you buy it uh, where it's been prepared and packaged commercially, uh, homemade vinegar, again, we can't 100% say if this is in essence a for forever food, that if you decant this and then uh, open it 10 years from now, will it still be perfect? Again, homemade things are a little unpredictable. So what I generally recommend is to try to use your homemade vinegars up within a year. Now, what to do with a fruit scrap vinegar? This works wonderful when making salad dressings or marinades and things like that. I generally don't use fruit scrap vinegars for cleaning. And the only reason is that sometimes they can be on a little bit on the sweeter or even the stickier side. So if you decided you wanted to experiment and use this for cleaning, you would probably want to dilute it considerably. And if at any time you get a little concerned about the state of your vinegar, you can always come back to your pH strips and check the pH. See what range it's in. If you're keeping it in your pantry, these might give you wonderful peace of mind, as well as if you're keeping it in your refrigerator. I really can't say enough good things about these. I think they're perfect for the traditional foods kitchen because even someone like me who's been making ferments for many, many years, I do from time to time like to use these when maybe I'm making a new type of vegetable ferment and I'm not 100% sure how long I really need to leave it on my counter to ferment. And this helps me know, oh, okay, it's below 4.6, which is usually, that's kind of the, the benchmark for sauerkraut. But I usually let everything go a little bit lower, a little more to the 4.0 range. But these give me peace of mind. So that's a wonderful thing uh, to have in a traditional foods kitchen. Now, if you'd like to learn how to make other types of fruit scrap vinegar, including a raw apple cider vinegar so that you never have to buy that at the store again, be sure to click on this video over here where I show you how to do that and lots more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.